Hello everyone and welcome to PC RetroTech. You might remember in the previous video we were looking at this MB467 Socket 3 motherboard. Uh, it's got PCI slots and it's based on the UM8886 and 8881 chipset pair. And we discovered that this board has no voltage regulator for 3.3 volt chips. So we weren't able to run the Intel DX4100 or the AMD 5x86 in this board. So I've been patiently waiting for parts to turn up. We discovered that there was a Japanese website with a very similar board and was able to identify the voltage regulator as an LM350T. Uh, so let's pick up the video this week and uh, see if we can make any progress with this board. Well, the LM350T voltage regulator has turned up in the mail at last. Uh, I don't need two of them, of course, uh, but I've got an extra one in case there are any accidents. Now, for the values of the capacitors, I don't know what to use. Uh, you can't read that on the uh, photograph on that Japanese website. Uh, but if you take a look, uh, it looks like the larger one is a bit bigger than the other capacitors surrounding the CPU, and the one at the bottom is slightly smaller. So what I've done is select uh, a 470 microfarad capacitor for the top location and a 22 microfarad capacitor for the bottom location. These could end up being a little large, but I don't think that's going to matter. The exact values aren't important here uh, because they're just doing some filtering. Now, as for the voltage regulator itself, I'm not just going to solder that directly in because there won't be any room for a heatsink because of this set of jumpers here. So I'm going to bend the pins and have it offset a little uh, so that there's actually room uh, to put a heatsink behind it. Now, I was a little bit worried that I might need to populate some of these components as well, which are also missing. Uh, but these don't seem to be used uh, in the board on that website either, so uh, I don't think we're going to need to put those in. The first thing I'm going to do is just suck some of that solder out of the holes there. It's a little hard to get this solder out, so what I've done is just add some additional solder. Uh, and that's done the trick. So we now have three nice holes that we can put the voltage regulator through. And now it should just be a matter of soldering those leads in. I've also soldered those capacitors in, uh, so I think everything is basically ready to go now. I won't put a heatsink on immediately, I'll try it out first and see just how hot it's getting, and then we'll probably end up adding one of those a little bit later. The first thing I'm going to do is a smoke test. I'm just going to power the power supply on with no CPU in there, just make sure we don't get any smoke, and uh, we'll measure that voltage which should appear at the jumpers. I've moved them over to the 3.3 volt position and they actually take the voltage from the voltage regulator and direct it to the CPU. So let's power on the power supply. Well, there's no smoke and this is not getting hot. That's a good sign. Uh, so let's take a look at that voltage. 4.67 volts, that's uh, way too high. I'm really not sure what's going on there, that's a bit strange. It doesn't seem to be regulating the voltage at all. Well, I wonder if that voltage changes under load. I've taken a look at the uh, data sheet for the LM350T and there's no real indication that that voltage should change too much with the load, which is the CPU in this case. Uh, but we haven't got anything to lose at this point. We've already had the jumpers in the 5 volt setting uh, which feed 5 volts into this CPU. Uh, so we're not going to damage it any further than we already have. Uh, and I just want to see if that voltage drops down to a lower value uh, with the CPU in the circuit. So just powering it on again. Uh, no smoke again, always a good sign. And let's just take a look at that voltage again. 1.6 volts. Uh, so it did drop down, but uh, that voltage regulator really isn't regulating very well. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on at this point. I'm scratching my head. Uh, something doesn't seem quite right with this circuit. Well, I tried all sorts of jumper settings here to try and get this CPU started, 
And uh, in fact, I've actually overlooked something almost obvious. Uh, if you look down between the jumpers and that resistor on the left hand side, that colored thing, uh, there's actually something else missing from the circuit here. It's a second resistor. Now if you take a look at that Japanese website again and look at the photograph, you can actually see that that resistor is there. You can't see the other one because it's hid by that uh, resistor network. Uh, but that one is definitely in the circuit. So I think we need to figure out what that is before we can get this to run. And it makes sense. There should be some kind of uh, you know, resistor network to set the voltage uh, for the voltage regulator. Uh, so I can't really see what that is. Uh, it looks like an orange and a brown, but uh, it really could be anything. And I don't have a way to figure out uh, what that is from this photograph. But what I can do is trace out this circuit here uh, more carefully and figure out where that resistor goes and then maybe compare it with one of the diagrams in the data sheet for the LM350T and we can maybe figure out uh, from the formulas in that data sheet what value that resistor should have. Well this is what I come up with. This is the 5 volt supply and ground here and this is our LM350T. It's got three pins uh, one of them is called adjust and there's voltage in which just comes from the 5 volts and there's our voltage out. So this is where we get our voltage for our CPU. Now that resistor that we can see in the circuit that's 30 ohms and that just goes from adjust to ground and this other resistor uh, that's missing goes from V out to uh, the adjust here. Uh, so this is definitely needed. Uh, it wouldn't be in the circuit like this uh, if it wasn't supposed to be there. So uh, now we need to figure out uh, which uh, circuit this is in the data sheet and maybe we can use the formula to figure this resistor out. And lo and behold, under application hints, it has that exact circuit. Uh, you can see that resistor pair there, R1 and R2. And R1 is the one that we need to figure out. It goes from V out to adjust. And we can use the formula on the left for this. We'll just plug in the values we know and we should be able to solve for the value of R1. Now there's a couple of things there that aren't completely obvious. Uh, so the output voltage is not given in terms of the input voltage, but instead it's given in terms of VRAF. Uh, but fortunately it tells us that no matter how you set this circuit up, VRAF will always be about 1.25 volts. Uh, so we can just plug that value in and the other part there, I adjust times R2 at the very end of the formula, we can just ignore it essentially. The notes say that this is just an error correction term and it's not something really important unless you're really critical about the voltage. Uh, so we'll just take the first part of the formula and solve for R1. Well the resistance that I come up with when I do that is 17.5 ohms and obviously we're not going to find a resistor with exactly that value. Uh, but I'll search around and see if I can come up with something relatively close and we'll try that out and see what happens. Well, I didn't manage to find an exact match for the resistor that I wanted here, but I've got 233 ohm resistors in parallel and that will do just fine. It should give us a voltage somewhere around about the 3.45 volt range, which still should be okay for the Intel CPU. Okay, well it's time to power this board up again with the CPU in circuit and measure that voltage and see how we're doing. So powering on the power supply. Uh, no smoke again, which is great. Uh, no heat either, that's good. Everything's cool. Alright, so let's take a look at that voltage and see what we've got. And we have 3.53 volts. Now that's actually okay, it turns out that Intel released an advisory in the early days of the internet, so you have to look on the internet archive to find it, and uh, this tells us that this CPU, which is an SK051 by the way, uh, will work from 3.3 to 3.6 volts. Uh, so we're in range here, it's at the upper end of it of course, but that's absolutely fine. Now if the acid tests, let's turn it on and see what happens. Well, nothing blows up, but unfortunately, still no picture on the screen, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to try a few jumpers and see if we can figure out what's going on. Well, I haven't had any luck with the DX4100 just yet, but uh, watch this. This is the AMD 5x86 chip. Uh, when I power that up, 
short delay and away it goes, it boots up. The Intel DX4100 does try to boot up, uh, you can actually see the screen come on, uh, it just doesn't go any further after that, so I'm assuming that's a jumper setting issue, but I'm not entirely sure just yet. Uh, I'll fiddle around with it some more and see if we can make any further progress here. But it's great news that we're going to be able to use our AMD 5x86 in this board. Well, I spent an enormous amount of time, in fact almost an entire day last week, just going through jumper settings and various ideas I had to try and get the Intel DX4100 working on this board. And I have to declare that uh, at this point I've given up. Uh, I don't think it's going to go on this board at all. Now, I don't know whether that's a bias issue or whether it's just something to do with my particular board. Uh, some of the other boards that look very, very similar to this one uh, actually do say in their manuals that they support the Intel DX4100. And it's even possible that this particular board will support the rarer uh, DX4100 with write back. This is the SK051, which just has write through cache. And uh, so this definitely doesn't work. Now, I was able to get the AMD versions of the DX4100 to work, both the write through and write back versions. And we already know that the AMD 5x86P75 works just fine. Uh, so I thought maybe I've damaged my Intel DX4100, uh, but I do actually have a second one of these and tried that out and it also didn't work. So I'm really pretty confident at this point I'm not going to be able to get the DX4100 working on this particular motherboard. Now the other thing that I tried to get the Intel DX4100 working is to go back to an older UMC board based on the UM8498F chipset and just remove jumpers and see which ones are absolutely essential to get a Quake benchmark to run. And I found that just one, this one here, wired to the C10 pin of the CPU, uh, which is the S reset pin, is actually needed. Uh, unless that's wired low, the CPU won't even boot, let alone run a benchmark. So I found the corresponding uh, pin on one of the jumpers on the other board and made sure it was wired low. And uh, the CPU will boot, you have to go through a complex sequence to get it to do so, uh, but it still won't run a benchmark without hanging. Uh, so I'm relatively confident that it's not just a jumper setting at this point, but just to make sure, I measured all the voltages of CPU pins that are exposed here and compared with the other board, and they're all identical. So it's not just a matter of something not wired high or low. Of course, there could be some other jumpers missing uh, to connect the CPU to the chipset, for example. But I went through all the SGS Thompson data sheet settings for a 486, even for this non write back enhanced one, and uh, that really just doesn't make any difference. So it's probably a bias issue or a chipset issue uh, or just a fault with that particular board, but it's not going to work with this CPU, so we're going to have to move on. In case anyone has this MB467 motherboard, uh, these are the jumper settings that I came up with. Uh, now we already had the front side bus settings in the previous video, and uh, these are the multiplier settings. There's 3 volt in this row and 5 volt in this row. And there's not much more to add to that. Uh, basically, if you want right back, uh, it's this jumper here. Otherwise, you take it off for right through. Uh, two times multiplier is at this end of the row, and you just take it off entirely for three times. And of course, there's that C10 jumper that I was talking about for the Intel DX4100. Not that it makes it work, of course. But other than that, uh, there's not really much more I can say about this board at the moment. But let's get the AMD 5x86 powered up. Uh, for that, we'll need the 2 times setting, and of course, it's a write back CPU. And uh, let's get some benchmarks. Well, I have the AMD 5x86 in, and I'm just running a Quake benchmark at this moment to give a score at the 133 MHz point, uh, just as a baseline to see how it's performing. And wow, we get a pretty low score, 10.9 frames per second. That seems really bad, actually. Uh, something doesn't seem quite right here. Well, I've discovered something really quite interesting. So when I go into Ray Van Tassel's cache check program, uh, it will basically uh, tell me that the CPU is running at 133 MHz, and everything looks fine uh, as it checks the first megabyte of memory. Uh, then it'll check the second megabyte of memory and see how the caching works with that. 
Uh, but when it gets to the third megabyte of memory, you can see it's already going quite slowly here. And look at the numbers, they're just so much higher, which is really slow. Uh, and then from there on, it'll just be very, very slow. So even uh, you know in the area where you'd expect the CPU to be caching, uh, it's not even doing that. So something is going really wildly wrong here. It's quite similar to that VIA board uh, that we saw on the channel previously, uh, where for some reason the cache values just get really bad from some point onwards. Uh, so I don't know what's causing this at the moment, so I'm going to have to investigate. It could be a faulty cache chip. Uh, maybe I've got the cache uh, settings incorrect on the board. Uh, or maybe there's just some other issue here which uh, I'm not understanding. Well, this is a turn up for the books. I figured it out. Uh, I went to a lot of trouble. I changed out the cache chips. Uh, no change whatsoever. But if I go into the BIOS settings and turn off power management, uh, then the problem goes away. It turns out that it was set up to uh, basically shut the CPU down after a very short amount of time, in fact just a quarter of a minute. Uh, so I'll disable that entirely and well, let's just switch everything off that we can. You can see that case check is now just reporting exactly the same values repeated over and over, which is exactly what we want to see. Uh, so that's all working. And that didn't seem to make any difference to the Quake score at all, so I'm probably going to have to fiddle around with the uh, cache and memory timings on this board uh, to get better performance uh, with this CPU. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to set the front side bus speed to 40 megahertz, uh, and that'll give us uh, 160 megahertz on the CPU. Uh, so the record that we have on the channel so far with this CPU at that frequency is 16.6 .6 frames per second. Uh, so let's see how much closer to that we can get. And I have to say I've been getting a surprisingly low scores here. Uh, so it's giving me just 11.8 frames per second, which is terrible for 160 megahertz. So I am now going to fiddle with the BIOS settings and see if I can get any better performance out of this. Uh, so far this board is really just not performing well. Well, I've been fiddling with the BIOS settings uh, for quite a while and I've managed to actually max everything out. So I turned auto config off and I basically set everything to zero weight states uh, right back uh, to 111, which is the fastest option there, um, and uh, zero weight states here, just enabled everything else and fast here. Uh, so this is the best that I can do. Uh, so let me show you what score we get now. And you can see just how much faster this is running here. It's just flying through. Uh, so this looks much more promising. Uh, let's see, and we get 16.8. We actually beat the record for the channel. Uh, that's incredible. So uh, yeah, this is only 0.2 frames per second faster than what we've had previously, but uh, that is absolutely flying. Uh, so yeah, this board turns out to not be so bad after all. There's a few other things we want to try, of course, and the first of those is this ARC 1000 PV video card. Now, I got this because the RAM on board is uh, 50 nanosecond, and because I heard that the ARC 1000 VL, the Visa Local Bus version of this, uh, goes really, really well. Uh, so, the first thing I'm going to do is try this at 40 megahertz front side bus and see if that works, and then if it does, uh, we'll try it at 50. Well, I have it plugged in, so let's power it on and see what happens. So I just have the CPU settings the same. So this is 40 megahertz front side bus. And it does seem to work okay at that frequency, which is great. Uh, so I'll go ahead and see whether we can get it to work at 50. Well, I have the front side bus at 50 megahertz now. Uh, I've just changed the multiplier to 3 because we're just testing the video card at this point. Uh, not the CPU. So let's just power that on and see what happens. And it's booting. Uh, do we get a picture? Yes, we do. So it looks like uh, it's going to work at 50 megahertz. Now, the other thing I've got here is some 50 nanosecond fast page memory. So I'm going to put that in as well. And we'll see if we can get a benchmark at 150 megahertz on this machine. Well, unfortunately, when I went into the BIOS, I found this host clock to PCI clock ratio, and this had been automatically set back to a half, which means that it wasn't really running the video card at 50. Uh, so I'll set that to one to one, and I'll show you what actually happens when you try to boot the machine. 
Uh, so it'll start up okay, you can hear the CPU, uh, the video is fine for now, uh, but as soon as it actually tries to boot the machine, uh, you'll hear the hard drive ticking away, uh, meaning that everything's booting just fine, but unfortunately uh, the video card basically bombs out, and if I try to reset the machine, you'll hear uh, one long and two short beeps, which means that the video card is not working. Now it's not getting hot at all, uh, it just isn't going to work at 50. So that's a bit of a disappointment, uh, it means that this PV card is not going to help us at all. Well the ET6000 works just fine at 50 MHz frontside bus of course, and so I've tried that out here. Uh, but I wasn't able to get that to work with the fastest cache settings, I had to knock them back just one setting. And uh, as you can see, the result is actually just slightly slower than we got 160 megahertz. Uh, we're at 16.7 frames per second, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Um, that probably means that there's nothing else we can do with this board. It doesn't have a 60 megahertz front side bus setting, even if we had a video card that would work at that frequency. Uh, so we basically can't go any further with this board. The video is already quite long, but uh, there's one final experiment that I want to do today, which I promised at the end of the previous video, to do with this SIS board. Uh, so this is a Visa Local Bus board, it's one we've seen on the channel before, the CH471A version 2, based on the SIS 85C471 chipset. And the interesting thing about this board is it has a full set of eight 32-pin uh, cache sockets. Now, uh, two of the recent boards that I purchased actually have 32-pin cache chips, and I can make up a full set of eight out of the two boards. Now, that'll give us 512 kilobytes of cache. I've actually tried this experiment already with another board. Uh, I had one other board that uh, supports uh, eight of these chips, uh, the VIA board, and unfortunately it just didn't even boot uh, with those, so no go there. But I suspect we might have more luck with this one. Uh, this board even supports one megabyte of cache, not that we have uh, chips that big. These are just 512 kilobit each. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, very carefully lever these chips out and put these other ones in and uh, see if I can find uh, some cache settings here uh, that work with those chips. I don't think they're all documented because uh, the manual doesn't talk about uh, the settings for 8 uh, 64K by 8 chips, uh, which is what we'll have. Uh, so I'm going to have to do some fiddling around to see if I can get that going. The other thing is we're not going to get really good performance out of this board unless we can get the 5x86 working. So I'm going to go through with a multimeter and find the multiplier pin. Uh, there was an issue with this board that we were unable to set the multiplier to 2. Uh, but we know so much more about this socket now and I'm pretty confident I'm going to be able to figure that out. Uh, just that pin needs to be tied to ground, and if necessary, I can just solder a wire onto it if I have to. Uh, so I think that we're going to be able to get this to go, and uh, let's see if we can get an even better Quake score. Well, I have actually managed to get this board to work uh, with the 512K cache and the AMD uh, 5x86. So to get the cache working, it turns out that uh, I set the jumpers for 256 kilobytes of cache. Uh, that's pretty weird. Uh, I would have thought that the 512k setting would have been the correct one, uh, but uh, this actually works and it detects as 512k cache. It actually shows that when you boot up. And moreover, cache check uh, shows that the cache is actually working. Now I had this bizarre issue for a while where uh, it wasn't caching at all, uh, you just have the uh, internal CPU cache and then the memory timings and nothing in between. And uh, I wasn't able to figure out which BIOS setting was causing that issue, so I just set back to default settings and then the problem just went away and I've not been able to recreate that problem at all, so very very bizarre issue there. Uh, to get the uh, AMD uh, 5x86 working, uh, I found the pin for 2 times multiply, which is down here, and I found a ground pin nearby and connected a cable uh, across here. It's just a CD cable just on the jumper pins. And uh, this actually works, so this gives us uh, 160 megahertz. Uh, now, the problem is that uh, this board uh, has a jumper here for multiplier. 
Uh, but it's supposed to have three pins, uh, and one version of this board actually has three pins, uh, so that you can actually set the multiplier and ground the multiplier pin. Uh, but this board just doesn't have that option. Uh, so that's uh, pretty funny. So this is a weird hack uh, to get around that issue. Uh, but everything's working now, guys. So I'm going to power it up and uh, see if I can get uh, a decent Quake score out of this board. Well, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get it stable. Uh, last night, I actually got a 16.9 frame per second Quake score on this machine, but I've not been able to replicate this. Uh, it actually worked first go as well, but since then I've run it many, many times and uh, it always bombs out, usually at this point or there's one other point or right before the end of the benchmark. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get a 16.9 on camera. Uh, well, if it's not on camera, it never happened, right? So uh, yeah, pr basically uh, this board performs very, very well. Uh, but it's just not stable at that performance level. So I'm going to go through and just try each of the settings in turn and knock it back and see what we actually have to do to get this stable, but I think that the score is going to be much lower. Well, unfortunately I'm going to have to give it up, guys. Um, I'm not able to get this board stable uh, at all. In fact, it doesn't seem to matter what uh, memory settings I choose. Uh, the something here is just not stable at uh, the 50 MHz front side bus. Uh, so that's it for this week. Um, I can't put any more time into this because otherwise the video won't get uploaded. Uh, so we will come back to this idea of having 512 kilobytes of cache. I have another motherboard uh, that will take that and uh, you'll see that in a future video. It's a shame that I can't get this board stable because it looks like it would give uh, the best performance of all the boards so far. Uh, but that's how the cookie crumbles. Uh, so anyway, if you liked uh, this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you in a later video. Bye.